Good morning, and welcome to the forum. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and it is a blessing to have you all here today. Almost two decades into the 21st century, I think we can all agree that we are living in very troubling times. While at the same time, first-hand survivors of the many of the 20th century's most traumatic events, the Holocaust, Hiroshima, the killing fields, are passing away. How do we carry their stories forward? Can we ensure that the horrors of the past are not forgotten? Can we learn not to repeat them? These are heavy questions, and our guest today is a best-selling novelist and poet. She's the author of The Survivor Cafe, uh, The Legacy of Trauma and the Labyrinth of Memory, and her first work of non it's her first work of nonfiction. She wrestles with these questions and her experience as the daughter of Holocaust survivors. The book was featured on NPR's All Things Considered and in the New York Times, as well as named one of the best books of 2017 by the San Francisco Chronicle. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Rossner. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. It's such a pleasure to have you. And um, when, you, when you were on your way here, I, we were talking very briefly about, about the book. And it is, it's like a tree itself, um, mm. branching in so many different ways and so many different connections all brought back to the root of our, of our common humanity mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and memory and the importance of, of you know, what it means to be a human being. But I, 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 there are so many times in there I could kind of, I mean, you, you talk a little bit about your childhood experiences and I could, I could almost imagine what you were like back then as a <laughs> child. And I wonder what that was like having your parents and just how it was that you began to understand what their experience had been, you know, uh, like, and, and, and did they have a kind of philosophy about what to, to tell you about and what to withhold from you, or do they just pretty much just share everything? Great question. I, when I think back to my childhood, and I say this in the book, that I don't have any specific memories of a, a scene, a moment, an event where my parents said, okay, sit down, we're going to tell you about our, our history, we're going to tell you about the Holocaust, we're going to tell you what happened to us and our families. There was no moment like that. I, I felt as though it, it so pervaded the atmosphere of my family and my home that I can't pinpoint anything like that. What I do remember is just this sense, and I actually even think it might have been a pre-verbal sense that I had, that something terrible had happened. Yeah. And, and that some of it was so terrible it was unspeakable. And that some of it was in some ways belonging to me too, even yeah. though none of it happened directly to me. And that, so for years, I think the questions that I asked and the curiosity that I had were always trying to piece together this puzzle that was probably always gonna remain incomplete. Yeah. And I don't think my parents ever had a conversation with each other about this. I don't, I don't think they came up with a plan or a strategy for how are we gonna raise our children knowing this story, knowing how this might affect them, should we protect them from it, should we overshare, you know. Yeah. I think um, in a lot of Holocaust survivor families, that was never a conscious decision. Some remained completely silent, and some, as I said, maybe overshared and couldn't stop talking about it. And then there's a whole spectrum in between, too. Yeah, it's interesting, because there's so much here. Here, And I, I also wonder just, like, how did you decide as the writer of the book, um, like, what did the audience need to know, and what <clears throat> did you assume that they already did know? Did you ever think that question as you were writing this? Constantly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was questioning myself constantly about every aspect of the book. I was questioning my capacity to find language to tell the things I wanted to tell. I was questioning my ability to frame the book in a way that would be both scholarly and accessible. I really wanted to make sure that I covered as much territory as I could horizontally, but I didn't want to sacrifice the vertical, the depth right, right. Of, the, of the subject too. So there were often times where I really felt overwhelmed by the subject yeah. matter because, as you know, I was wanting to talk not just about the Holocaust, but about other genocides and other atrocities and all of the ways that the residue of those traumas stays with us generationally. And of course, while I was writing the book, new genocides have been unfolding. Right, exactly. And so this feeling of kind of 
infinite subject matter mm -hmm. also overwhelmed me. So there were times when I was trying to fill in the gaps of, of history for people who might not know as much as I did about, for example, the Holocaust. But then there were subjects that I wasn't very knowledgeable about that I had to dig into more deeply, like the, the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsis. I'm still learning more about right, that right. even now. I just attended a conference um, in Sacramento over the past few days that was focusing on um, genocide globally, but also using highlights in, in focusing on the Rwandan genocide and even just the language that we use right, about exactly. that. Right, exactly. The, the exactly. words for, that the oppressive class would use for the, the people they were trying to, to right. you know, horrify. And so that's a theme in the book for sure, yeah. is, is the power of language, what even ambiguous language can do, the harm that ambiguous right, language right. can do, and then often, as you know, the inadequacy of language to talk about things that, that are bigger than we really have words for. Yeah. My daughter said, I told her about meeting you, and I talk, told her about the book, and, and she said, um, she, she asked this question, she said, what effect do you think just the Holocaust had on your parents' relationship? Like, like how was that kind of like the elephant in the room, or not mm. the elephant mm. in the room? But I thought that was an interesting question. I just, mm -hmm. I didn't have any idea how you'd respond to that. Yeah, I, you know, another question that's hard to answer because, um, you know, every family has its own yeah. mystery and and every family's dynamic is what it is. And I don't mean that in a simplistic way. It's just, that was my family. Those were my parents. They had that background. It was a, both a shared background and a very, very yeah. distinctively different background. My father was born in Germany. His parents divorced when he was seven. He was placed in an orphanage. He was eventually sent to a concentration camp. My mother was an only child, raised in Vilna, Lithuania, that they were herded into the ghetto, she ended up in hiding. I mean, so when they met as refugees, they had already been through so oh, yeah. much that it's impossible to know who would they have been without those experiences. Right, right. How much of them was so permanently shaped by what they lived through that that formed everything about their relationship. And yet, I also know that they didn't talk about it that much yeah. with each other even. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, there's, there, I, one of my favorite things about the book is uh, you talk about just how different generations are affected by, the, mm -hmm. by, by a trauma. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I definitely see that in my own family's mm -hmm. life of, of just having this terrible thing that happens in the next generation. It, it still has a huge meaning in the next, mm -hmm. but it's still, it is like part of our DNA, as mm -hmm. you say. Maybe you can mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that too, just you know, how yes. is trauma passed down? So as I said before, this feeling that I had growing up of, of being impacted by what happened to my parents, it was very confusing, but it felt very real. And, and it felt both physical, emotional, psychological. And when I would meet other people like me, whose parents had been survivors also, we had this in common, this yeah. kind of, maybe we were hypervigilant, maybe we, you know, I know people who would like literally keep a suitcase packed at all times yeah. because they thought that was how, catastrophic the world was about to be at any moment yeah. and and yet we had our differences too it was just that often we had been told we were imagining things uh. or that we were too sensitive or that we just had flights of fancy or that we were um, somehow carrying a burden that we didn't need to carry and it's only relatively recently and and once I started working on this book even though I'd been writing about this for a long time, that I came across epigenetics. And I don't know how many of you in the audience have been hearing this term epigenetics. It's, it's becoming a very um, frequent topic right now. We, we had Robert and Sapolsky on like four weeks ago. Oh, he talked a little bit okay, about it you know, great. in his books. Yeah, yeah, so epigenetics was a study of, of generational change in plants for quite a long time, but only somewhat recently have they been studying it in humans. And the first studies of mice actually were showing that if you exposed a group of pre-adolescent mice to the scent of cherry blossom and an electric shock, they very quickly learned to be terrified of the smell. And even when the shock wasn't present, when the smell was introduced, they panicked. And three and four generations of mice later, the first time 
these young mice were exposed to the scent, they panicked. This was without having ever been shocked and without ever having witnessed their parent or grandparent mice being shocked in the presence of the smell. So these researchers were concluding that somehow the DNA modification that occurred with the, the mice in the original study was being transmitted generationally. And at the same time, researchers were looking at Holocaust survivor families and finding that children and grandchildren were exhibiting signs of PTSD that didn't make sense given their own history of not being traumatized. And so they were putting that information together. And mm. the idea isn't that the genes themselves are being changed, it's that switches on the gene are being turned on, turned off by trauma that impact stress hormone levels. And so either people's cortisol is way elevated all the time, so they're in fight, flight, or freeze all the time, or the cortisol levels are so suppressed and and muted that they never react, that they're almost numb and, and you know, unstressed because they're not even experiencing what's happening in their environment. And so my sense is that a whole generation of us, and maybe many generations now, are feeling validated finally. Right, you know, right. science is proving <laughs> what, we've, what we right. have felt and, and sensed in our bodies and in our life experience that was seemingly inexplicable otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, the studies are ongoing. Human studies, the samples are small. The, um, there's debate in the psychological community about how can you really tell whether something was environmental or genetic and, you know, maybe it's a predisposition but not... A, a prediction, you know, so there are all these nuances about the, the information, but, but I can say that for someone like me, um, there is this deep sense of reassurance that I didn't imagine this, I didn't make this up, but now knowing this, what can I do about right, it? Right, right. You know, so there's a way that in, in some ways it also makes healing and transformation more possible because yeah. you've identified what it is. Yeah, definitely. I, I, your, the, the stories that you tell about you know, going back to Buchenwald those three times with your father are just so powerful. Each time, just uh, you know what you're noticing and mm -hmm. you know how. I mean, uh, the, even just the decisions about how do you represent the past. Uh, uh, you know, um, what it, what it, what do the you know the direction signs say? What you know? How do you you know authenticity is being so important, mm -hmm. and how do you mm -hmm. maintain that authenticity? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk about just like your first time back, and then just how you began to learn about what your father's experience was like, because, you know, it, it, um, it, it seems like it was something that you kind of come into consciousness over a period of time rather mm -hmm. than just like, like you said, he didn't sit you down and say, you right. know, on the seventh day I was there, X happened, and right. then, you know. Yeah, well, uh, coming back again to this way that my parents were representing different ways of being survivors. So even though we tend to categorize groups of people as Holocaust survivors or incest survivors or war survivors. I mean, within those groups, of course, there are multiple distinctions. And so my mother's trauma took the form of her being so overwhelmed with emotion when she would go into her memories mm -hmm. in response to a question that we learned pretty early not to be asking her questions. Yeah. And so I know much less about my mother's experience than my father's. My father seems to have more of a way, even now, of compartmentalizing his experience. And whether that's just something in his temperament or something he learned as a survival strategy, it's not clear to me. But he would answer my questions up to a point. And there was a point in my early 20s where um, I decided that I wanted, um, I was in Europe traveling and I was on a train that stopped in the Hamburg train station. And Hamburg is where my father was born and lived until the age of 15 when he was deported to Buchenwald. And I was frozen. I could not get off mm -hmm. the train. And so when I came back to California after that, I called my father in New York where I grew up and, and said, I want to go to Germany, but I want you to come with me. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a whole complex set of conversations yeah. because he both wanted to do it and dreaded doing it. But we did go, and so we went in 1983 when Germany was still divided. I was 23, he was 53, 
And when we first started in Hamburg, he passed a kidney stone while we were there. Oh, so his oh. whole, speaking of embodied memory, embodied trauma, his body was literally enacting the history he felt. And, um, but he pressed on because that's my dad, you know? Oh. So we, we rented a car and drove to Berlin because we had to go through Checkpoint Charlie to get into East Germany. Mm. And that was a whole other scene of watching my father literally go into another state of terror because there were Germans in uniform right, with guns. guns yeah. Taking your passports. Taking our passports yeah, and disappearing your, with them. Yes, oh <laughs> and gosh. you know, so this was my first experience of this, but I, I can tell you that I was I felt so connected to my father as I always have that I felt like I was not just witnessing his experience, but I was feeling it also. And we finally got to Weimar and to the site of the former camp, and there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. And the East Germans at that time were, their way of commemorating the past was to kind of rewrite history according to their own current standard. And at that time, it was all about communism being victorious over fascism. So there was no mention of Jewish prisoners, there was no mention of the Holocaust, it was about the war to overcome fascism. And it was an extraordinary experience that I write about at length in the book, and by the end of it, that was when my father said, um, now I wanna come back with the whole family. Uh -huh. Because at that moment, it was really just the two of us there, and I think he must have sensed that something was really being transmitted to me that he recognized what it wasn't enough just to end with that. Right. So all of us as a family went back in 1995 for the 50th anniversary of liberation of the camp. Everything was different. Germany had reunified. The Germans who organized this set up a banquet on the site of the camp. Wow. So if you've ever seen a Fellini film, that's what was <laughs> happening. It was. <laughs> So surreal, yeah. uh, this giant tent, huge tables laden with food. These former prisoners who were still in Eastern Bloc countries were coming in and taking pineapples off the table and stuffing them inside oh, their yeah. coat pockets and right. you know, like reliving all their hunger again. And my siblings and I, my older sister, my younger brother and I, we rushed to bring my father plates of food. He took one bite and his front tooth fell out. So he got in front of our eyes transformed into this like ghoulish kind of right, right. unrecognizable <laughs> person. So th things like that happened over and over, this way that the past and the present kept colliding. And, and then of course the third trip I took to Germany with him um, to visit Buchenwald was in 2015. And that's where the title of the book comes from. It was the 70th anniversary now and there were three generations, my father, the survivor, me, and my nephew was there. And the Germans were also three generations, and they organized this event now called Survivor Cafe. And I had never seen those two words together before. Right. I, you know, it was cognitive yeah, dissonance exactly. again for me. And what they were asking the survivors to do was talk to locals about their experience. and. Um, again, a surreal kind of atmosphere of cameras and, you know, giant microphones and big lights and, and two of the survivors who had returned were wearing their prison camp uniforms. Wow. So they were, again, presenting the embodied presence of the past, they were saying to me, you know, we never stopped wearing these in some right, way. Right. And, and there was also this need, again, to prove it, because I think one oh, of the yeah, things we need so to talk I'm about exactly is, right. you know, what, what does denial do? Exactly. What does historical revisionism do? What is that do? psychology? I mean, I, I would love to, I mean, it just seems so yeah. out there. I, I, I don't know if I've, I've never met a Holocaust denier, and yeah. I, so I just don't, I don't, I, could you talk to us about that I a have, bit? I yeah. have met a few. Yeah, I figured you um, might, just as part, as part of your research. Yeah, you know? it's, I, again, I, I literally physically react with yeah. a kind of shock and, and sometimes numbing almost when someone um, recently said to me, it was a young student um, actually when I was giving a presentation and he said, well, what about the other side? 
And I said, <laughs> what other side? Completely. I know. Uh, and I said, what other side? Because I was thinking, I sure, I'm sure I don't understand what right, he means right. when he's asking me this question. And he said, because I had talked about, because in part of my father's narrative, he often says he was in Hamburg until 1944. He was, it's a long, complicated set of miracles why he wasn't deported earlier. He was 15, he was very savvy, he was paying a lot of attention, and yet he didn't know what Buchenwald was. When they told him they were sending him to Buchenwald, he thought, oh, it's some kind of deportation center. And so he would say, you know, there were Germans who didn't know what was happening. Mm. So this guy had heard me say that, and he said, what about the other side? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if there were Germans near the camps who didn't know they were there, maybe they weren't there. Wow. Maybe, maybe they really didn't exist. And I was stunned into speechlessness. Yeah. You would think I would be prepared, <laughs> and I was, I, I was really inadequate in my reply to him. I said, there are no two sides to this. Yeah. There are facts and there are deniers of those facts. And, and he said, well, what do the Germans say? <laughs> and I said, well, actually the Germans are the ones most committed right now to keeping the historical facts alive. Right. Not all of them, but many and most of them. And then I just said, you've got to get educated. Like, I just shut down. Right, I mean, I, right. and so this past few days when I was at this conference in Sacramento on genocide, um, when I said to you earlier about ambiguous language being dangerous, so it's not even overt denial. There's something they're now calling hard denial and soft oh, denial. Right and active denial and passive denial. Yeah. So if you just plant a few seeds of doubt, not you deny everything, but you say, no, not six million Jews, maybe one or two million, uh. but surely not. You know, that already starts to undermine people's sense of right. truth and facts. And in the case of the Rwandan genocide, it turns out when you just say Rwandan genocide, and for those of you that don't know, in 1994, during a period of 100 days, somewhere between 800,000 and 1 million Tutsis were murdered by their Hutu neighbors with machetes and clubs. If you just say Rwandan genocide now, there are Hutus saying that the Tutsis also killed the Hutus. And there have been Hutu Rwandans seeking asylum in America, considering them, calling themselves Rwandan genocide survivors. Wow. Yeah. And they received asylum here, and it took years, several years for people to learn that in fact, they not only participated in the genocide, some of them were leaders of the genocide, mm -hmm. hiding in plain sight. And so now the language that the Rwandans are insisting upon is the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsis that you cannot simply say Rwandan genocide. And of course, many of us know that the phrase Armenian genocide is illegal to say in Turkey. Right, right. So that form of denial is, is just unthinkable. And yet here we are in America using language that's also very problematic, yeah. calling people illegals, Right, right. Uh, you know, uh, even even a term that maybe some of us might have thought was harmless, like referring to Vietnamese refugees as boat people, that's dehumanizing yeah, language. Yeah. You know, obviously calling people immigrants rather than refugees changes the way we think and feel about these mm -hmm. humans in, in desperate straits seeking asylum. You know, so one of my messages in this book and in all of the talks I give is, is for people to pay much careful, much more careful attention to how they listen to language and how we use language, because it can be so unconscious and, and so impactful. 
You know, I mean, I, that's funny. As, as you're talking, I'm, I, I'm just thinking the things I'm taking away from this for the future. I mean, I can imagine five years from now. I mean, one of the things that struck me most was just kind of the ethics of telling the story. Mm -hmm. And like, how do you, how do, like all those images that I have in my heart about, you know, what happened in Auschwitz and in Buchenwald, like where did those come from? Mm -hmm. And you talk about that, just like how, how, um, how these events are represented in film, mm -hmm. in books, in music. And I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about the ethics of that. Like, mm -hmm. what makes a representation, uh, you know, w one that, that is important in contributing to our memory of what happened and, and what in, in, in representations, you know, demean the people who, yeah. are, who are part of it? It's a really complicated question. And there are so many people with more authority in a way than I have about how to differentiate and use your discernment between, you know, a well-intentioned but misrepresenting image of, right. you know, like people who only know about concentration camps because they've seen Schindler's List, you know, that's not a documentary film, right? That's a feature film. Right, right. So with, with actors and with um, a story that's somewhat romanticized even, even though that, you know, I, I know Spielberg was trying very hard to be accurate in his representation, but, um, you know, for me, intention matters a lot. Mm -hmm. That that sense of deference that, that I hold and that I would hope other artists and other historians and writers would hold toward, um, I am, receiving these stories and, and offering them through my own transmission. I'm going to alter it even unconsciously because it's passed through me. It doesn't originate in me. But what we know about memory is that even our own memories are altered with right, time and exactly. with retelling. Yeah. So, you know, what Brian Stevenson is doing in Montgomery right now with the lynching memorial yeah. that just opened um, recently some of it isn't even trying to create imagery and representation. I mean, there are photographs of lynching. There are postcards that people sent around showing that they were present at a lynching as if it was some kind of celebratory event. So we do have real documentation, but some of the memorializing also includes saying the names of the victims. Right. You right. know, keeping alive the individual experience of victimization so that it doesn't blur with time into something abstract and therefore harder to hold on to. So he was borrowing some of his um, design and, and planning from what someone named Gunter Demnig has been doing in Europe right. Right. of placing what are called Stolpersteine or stumbling stones on the streets throughout Europe in front of residences where Jews were taken away to be murdered. And so that you're looking, you know, this gold stone catches your eye as you're walking and you see here lived the name of this person. And again, it personalizes and humanizes the victims. So that's not trying to accurately represent, you know, here's this person's whole life, right, you right. can't do that. But it's reminding us that we are standing on the ground of a place where an atrocity happened to an individual or a family. And what Brian Stevenson is doing with the lynching memorial is, is using soil from the sites where these lynchings took place to help people make that connection, that this is the memorial in Montgomery, but these sites were all over the South and you might find yourself elsewhere in the South standing on a place where someone was lynched. Yeah. And when I think about, you know, we talked about the tree all the way at the beginning, you mentioned, thankfully, the, the tree imagery yes. of the book itself. Oh, yeah. And I write about trees as survivors and trees as witnesses. And, um, and I heard this amazing um, snippet of conversation between the poet Dorian Locks and the poet Lucille Clifton, right. when Dorian was taking Lucille around and showing her California and saying, aren't these the most gorgeous trees, these redwoods, these Monterey Pines? And Lucille said to Dorian, you know, Dorian, black people have a complicated relationship with trees. Yeah. And hearing that just gave me, I don't know if you experienced chills just then, I get chills every time I recite it because this idea that things we take for granted in the world, 
imagistically have very right. different meanings, meanings yeah. in, in our bodies. And so for Jews, you know, sometimes there was a period where at Auschwitz, at the site of Auschwitz that is now a m museum and a memorial, they installed some outdoor showers for people to cool off during hot oh. weather. And what were they thinking? Yeah, right, what completely. were they thinking? Showers yeah. at Auschwitz, like yeah. anybody, a kid will, who's studied a little bit of Holocaust history will know that there's a very dreadful association between showers and Auschwitz. Yeah. So you mentioned turning on the gas to somebody who's been, right, you know, yeah. at all in, in any way connected to the Holocaust, and that will set off a kind of alarm. So to think that there's nothing innocent, really, right. you know, that even a tree isn't innocent if it was the site of a lynching. Right, right. You know, I mean, one of the powerful things for me is just, you know, just you as a writer, because in a way, I mean, you're helping us to see the, the exact points that you just made, um, and, and you're doing it yourself. I mean, and I wonder just like if you can talk about just like how you got here as a writer and just, you know, you, you mentioned it a little bit in the book when you feel like kind of a, a sense of calling to be a writer, mm -hmm. and, and then, and and, and yet all this memory is wrapped up in that too. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder mm -hmm. if you can just talk about just like the, the, being a writer and then um, writing your, I mean, this is your first nonfiction work and, and just how that, that happened and what. You know, when people ask me, did you always want to be a writer? I say, well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a painter, a dancer, a singer, an actor, a, you know, I, and a writer and a, you know, musician. And, and I think what that, says to me as I look back is that I, I was just full of emoting. Yeah. Like I just wanted to try and respond creatively and expressively to all the things that I felt that I had absorbed and was absorbing. And anecdotally, I've heard that descendants of survivors like myself are overrepresented either in the fields of the arts or in psychotherapy. <laughs> 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 that we're either therapists trying to help other people express themselves and feel their feelings, or we are in therapy trying to, you know. So I, I think that's probably true, even though it may be um, hard to measure. But so I knew that, that there were things I needed to say and, and that writing turned out to be the way that I felt most able to access my heart and my head simultaneously, and, and my body too. I mean, even though dance for me is incredibly potent as a form of expression, I would feel like my mind wasn't engaged enough. Oh, yeah. Or um, So I found that, that writing allowed me to work on multiple levels of experience, and, and I was also aware that I had always been listening with all of me, you know, that I had been listening with my senses, but also listening inside as well as outside. And, and that as a writer, I feel like my greatest tool is my listening capacity. Mm -hmm. And that in this book in particular, and also in my novels where I was, you know, when I write, I feel like I'm, I'm hearing the words, I'm hearing the dialogue, I'm seeing the scene. Um, when The Speed of Light, my first novel, was, um, was optioned for a film for a while, um, the first thought I had was, I've already watched that movie. Oh, right. You know, I, That's like, great. Because I've I was watching that. it when I was yeah. writing the book. But with this book, I was really, um, you know, we talked about Anna Devere Smith as one of my, one of my inspirations and, and heroes, and, and her way of embodying her interview subjects to the point where she's taking on all of their gestures and being absolutely committed to um, meticulous observation translated into her, her body, her speech, her accent, her use of expression. And that when I was interviewing people for my book and, and reflecting on survivor conversations I had had and thinking about my parents and thinking about what I was learning about people who survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki and internment camps here in America. And I really felt this obligation to use my whole being, mm -hmm. you know, to enter into that space of really respecting both what they were saying and, and sometimes what they weren't saying, you yeah. know, and that, that silence is very holy to me also. And I would like to think that the book isn't just filled with words, but it's also filled with the spaces in between words yeah. that 
where stories of atrocity leave out as much as they include. Right. You know, it's really often impossible to do justice to an experience of trauma with mere language. Yeah, and that's one of the things I like about there. It's almost like there, there are moments, I mean, be, uh, you know, where, where the writing breaks off, and it's almost like an invitation for us to, to see how we're internalizing this, how we're taking mm -hmm. this. And there's so many times, too, I, I mean, I, I, I wonder if part of it's just our, growing up in our, our generation that there was this sense of, you know, when you talk about having your passports taken at Ch Checkpoint Charlie, I remember feeling that, too. I mean, it was, it was almost like pervaded all, mm -hmm. you know, it, mm -hmm. was, it was hard to go back there for that. Yeah, and I think that's a point that I really want to emphasize, too, is that although I'm drawing on my own personal legacy of being a daughter of Holocaust survivors, whereas in the earlier part of my life that felt as though it was something that set me apart from others, or when I would be in school and people would be learning about the Holocaust yeah. by reading something in a textbook, and I would think, don't you understand? That happened to my family, you know? but. But over time, I began to understand that this actually connects me with every other human yeah. being. We all carry wounds of history, some of which we know more about and some of which we know less about, some of which go farther back into our ancestry and some which are very recent. But it, it is the human experience, unfortunately. Yeah. But that what it can in, invite is that feeling of, um, greater empathy right. and greater sense of of connectedness and interconnectedness that we need we really need more than ever right now yeah, definitely one of our traditions here I've, i should have told you about this earlier maybe we sent you an email about it is we um take questions from our audiences and so mm. um rebecca nessel is um is taking your questions um and uh we have one right up here um rebecca um and Good. they write them on little cards and Good. oh this is i mean all about dialogue for me like the the whole survivor cafe title of the book yeah. It's about conversation. The cafe <laughs> image is, is so bizarre in a way, but, but it, is, it is one of the most important ways we can help each other understand. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really true. Um, you know, uh, one of the things, you, you quote um, Elie Wiesel in your, your, um, in your book. He writes, our future depends on our testimony. To forget Auschwitz is to forget Hiroshima, the next Hiroshima. It's a paradox. Only Auschwitz can save the planet from Hiroshima. Mm. I mean, that was a, a really a, 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 a powerful moment for me, too. And maybe you can talk a little bit about just nuclear weapons in particular. I mean, you, you, um, you know, studied what happened in Japan. And I mean, it, that, that's an example of, a, of a, a terrible tragedy that was you know, caused by you know, the American government, the Amer right. Americans. Right. Um, I wonder what you used to say, too, just about, you know, like, why are we in such denial about nuclear weapons? Yeah, really good question. Why are we in such denial about the harm we Americans have done right. on this earth to other, to other nations, it, to populations in our own country. We are still unwilling to recognize the genocide of Native American peoples in our own yeah. country. Um, we are very reluctant to acknowledge our participation in, in ongoing genocide right now, which is taking place in Yemen. Um, our role in providing arms to the Syrian government. I mean, we are so complicit. Yeah. And, you know, you said earlier, like, you know, denial is so unfathomable. How could, how could any thinking sentient being deny something as horrific as, as genocide? And yet, you know, I think it's complicated because if you acknowledge atrocity, then you have to take responsibility right, for exactly. doing something yeah. about it. And so, if we acknowledge our complicity, then we have to make amends and then we have to, you know, really do something to reckon with our own war crimes. These are war crimes. Yeah. So denial is very convenient in a way. There, as I was saying earlier, the hard denial, the soft denial, ultimately all of that enables us to protect ourselves from accountability. And um, I have to say that for me, one of the underlying unifying factors in so many genocides and so much denial is race and, right. and racist injustice that, w that if, 
if the extent to which genocide was happening in the world right now was impacting white people, we would be doing a lot more to prevent it mm -hmm. than we are currently. Yeah. I just believe that in my soul. And so we have to acknowledge the racial divide or the racial disconnect and, and see how that allows us to be blind to our own role. And I'm a first generation American. It would be very easy for me to say, my people aren't responsible for Native American genocide. My people aren't responsible for slavery. But as a white person living in America, I am responsible for the state of my country. I am responsible for um, what was done to turn this country into what it is now. Yeah. I am responsible for the benefits I live with. So it's complicated. Yeah. It's complicated denial, but um, we, really, um, we really have choices. Right, exactly, we do. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this because that's good handwriting. Um, <laughs> why is it that, yeah, this is one of my questions too. Why is it that rhetoric of hate finds such a fertile ground in a significant part of the population, particularly where the rationale for hate is based on um, racial grounds. It was in Germany in the 1930s, and it is here, uh, it is, it is um, here almost 100 years later. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for another Holocaust? Thank you. It's a good segue from what I was just talking about because I, you know, many people know this already, but I'll just repeat it that, you know, the architects of the final solution, um, Hitler obviously included, were using a lot of their race laws, their anti-Semitic race laws, because they were modeled after American race laws. You know, what we were doing in the Jim Crow era of um, making it illegal for blacks and whites to intermarry, to, you know, live together, to work together, to have shared communities, those race laws served as inspiration to the Nuremberg Laws and ultimately to the concentration camps and the genocide and the attempt to extinguish all evidence of Jewish life in Europe. These were not original ideas in Germany in the 1930s. They were based on histories of racist hatred that including what existed in the United States. So there is this tendency we have as human beings to dehumanize the other when we ourselves feel threatened. That if there's some way in which my possessions or my status or my safety in whatever way, if I imagine that I'm in some kind of danger, I want to look for the cause of that danger outside of myself, and if it's somebody else, I want to eliminate that. And, and under the right circumstances and with the right kind of manipulation of propaganda and so on, we can be persuaded that our enemy is our neighbor and that our neighbor isn't human. And that's what, when the Hutus were being told, kill all the cockroaches, mm -hmm. that was the term being used for the Tutsis, who doesn't want to kill cockroaches? When you say that the Jews are rats and vermin that need to be exterminated because they are spreading plague and they are trying to destroy you, who doesn't want to eliminate a rat infestation? I mean, you can persuade people that it is in their own best interest to hate. Mm. And you know, this weekend, as I've mentioned a couple of times, this conference, there, there's, there are centers now being established in various universities to study hatred. What is it in us that right, inclines right. us to hate in such virulent ways that we are not only willing to kill someone who has lived next door to us for decades, but a child, right, right, that, that a baby, yeah. you know, that you can you can so dehumanize someone else's child that you think you are saving your own life by murdering a child. Yeah, that humans are capable of this. We have to understand our own dark capacities for evil, we yeah, do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm curious about the form of the book and how you arrived at the structure. Did it evolve? Were you always clear on how to approach the subject? Thank you. I love talking about the structure of the book because um, I love structures of things. Yeah. And, and I do, there's a, just a, it's very defined, I like Well, that. and architecture for me in a writing process comes late. I, you know, there's a long stretch of time where when I'm writing, everything is 
pretty much in a state of chaos. Yeah. And it's how long I can tolerate that chaos <laughs> until I finally get to the point where some, some switch is flipped in me and I just say, okay, I got to figure out what, what this is going to look like structurally. And so strangely for this book though, my editor and I came up with the table of contents early on because initially I thought it was going to be an essay collection and that the chapters were going to be disparate units um, that interconnected but actually were somehow self-contained. And eventually I came to realize um, as I was working on those individual chapters that really they were all part of one big conversation. It's just that um, it wasn't a linear conversation and it wasn't even a chronological conversation. So when I referred to, for example, the three different trips to Germany, 83, 95, and 2015, you would think I would have gone in chronological order or maybe reverse chronological order, but instead, <laughs> I, not to confuse you or anything, but I start with 2015 because I wanted people to understand where the title came right, from. Right and to set the stage for you for the most recent set of memories. And then I went back to 1983 because that was the first trip and those layers in between impacted each other. And I wanted to show you how the most recent trip both referred me all the way back to the first trip and then the 95 trip comes later because it was in between. And, and it's not a rational explanation, but it's an intuitive kind of creative way of saying this is how memory works, this is how emotional memory works. Well, it's how we experience things in conversation too. Yeah. It's not and you, you know, my, my scatterbrained sounds pejorative, but um, I, I feel sometimes scatterbrained because my brain does tend to scatter and branch off. and but I always come back <laughs> eventually. So the book really for me also does have a very definitive sense of continuity, mm -hmm. even when it breaks down into fragments. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question. Regarding our current immigration policy, can you imagine how much today's immigrant infants will have their DNA altered and passed on to their next generation after the horrible trauma of being snatched and expelled from their parents? Yeah, I'm writing now in a new book about family separation and how what's happening now is an echo of, of not just what happened during the Holocaust, but what happened um, during slavery as well. That, you know, a, a, a foundational element of slavery was family separation and taking children away from parents, separating parents from one another. And so the the DNA level damage, again, I think is absolutely ongoing, residual, generational, and we know now that the damage we're causing mm -hmm. is going to reverberate into the future, right. and yet we're doing it anyway. And, and, you know, other people, other scholars have talked about this, the, the intentional infliction of cruelty is what we're seeing now. This isn't, oh, we're going to do what we think is right and find out the consequences later. We know the consequences. Yeah. We are choosing to enact behaviors that we know are going to have devastating consequences. And that is, you know, I don't know the numbers because it's painful for me to hold on to them, but I think we're talking about hundreds of thousands of children um, in danger of of starvation in Yemen right now. And this isn't abstract. Right. This is, this is genuinely consequential physical impact. And um, it's painful to recognize that this is happening on our watch. I, I don't know what that phrase even means, yeah, right. except that what it evokes for me is the notion that there's no such thing as an innocent bystander. There really isn't. We are witnessing atrocity in our lifetimes, and, and we each have to decide for ourselves what we're going to do about it. But I write in the book also about something that, um, in the study of veterans of war, we are finding out can be termed moral injury. Mm -hmm. And it is the wound to not just a soldier, but I think to anyone who fails to intervene to prevent an atrocity. Right, right. Our morality, you keep using the word ethics, our morality is, is injured when we fail to act. And, um, you know, 
we, uh, we are individuals and we are a collective. We have choices about what we are going to allow to be done in our name. Yeah. And right now we're, we're at a critical moment. I mean, we've been at a critical moment for a while, but uh, vote. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and yes. <laughs> Thank you very mm. much. Um, can you share your thoughts on how your work may address issues of ongoing poverty, homelessness, um, the lack of health care, and associated trauma here in the USA? Yeah, the, you know, what I don't write about in the book, but, um, but if, you, if you've heard about epigenetics, you may have also heard about something called ACEs, ACEs. Um, the acronym stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And there's now a template or a, um, a measuring tool that is being used with um, children to intervene early to recognize what kinds of traumas children are being exposed to as early as possible so that we can um, prevent these measurable outcomes that are physiological in them. We now know that early exposure to um, domestic violence, homelessness, um, a suicide in the family, substance abuse in the family, poverty, um, poverty uh, you know, these impacts show up in life expectancy, in cardiovascular disease, and, you know, measurable health effects. And so, again, knowledge can be power if we use the knowledge. So pediatricians, teachers, parents, people who work with children have to understand how to recognize these signs as early as possible and to offer assistance, support, treatment, you know, I'm not a specialist in, in social work, but those areas where, um, as one leading researcher in epigenetics likes to say, you know, if we can be biologically changed by trauma, that means we can biologically heal also. You know, so it's not permanent damage. It doesn't have to be transmitted ongoingly. There is, there is hope, and I want to, you know, I mean, I feel like so much of this conversation can feel so exhausting and despairing and, and in a way disempowering, but I want to say these messages of healing and hope are so important to hold on to. It isn't a doomsday scenario to see this generational residue. We can reverse the damage. We can heal. Neuroplasticity tells us, you know, brain injury can be resolved through, through treatment modalities. So, you know, there's hope and we have to remember that too. Yeah, and like you say, I mean, we're connected to each other through our traumas also. I mean, there's a way in which um, you, you've, you've been able to big, build bridges in your own life and with us that, in connections too that... that um, the imagery in Japan that I love, one of them is um, the, the ceramic practice called kintsugi, the, the art of golden repair. And many of you have probably seen yeah. examples of this, a, a piece of broken pottery that's, that's restored with gold filling in the cracks. And it's a way of saying, both metaphorically and literally, look how much more beautiful this object is having been broken. Yeah. It's not to hide the damage and make it look as though it never shattered. It's a way to accentuate the broken places and say, this too is beauty, this too is human. And so for us to remember that, yes, we all carry wounds, we are all broken, we are all carrying ancestral harm and sorrow, and how can we hold that lovingly with each other to say, you know, who are you, what do you carry, how can I help you? Yeah. Can you advise us on a way to keep appreciation of history and survivors as part of our daily life without being stuck in a crisis mentality? Whew, um, they're, they're a pretty bright group. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. These are challenging me too because, you know, these are not simple questions or simple answers. I mean, you know, Dr. Yehuda, who I just mentioned a moment ago, was the one who said, if we can be changed biologically, we can heal biologically. She said, you know, there is an evolutionary reason that this is happening. It is good to be hypervigilant sometimes. Mm. You know, so crisis mentality isn't necessarily a bad thing to be in. Like use that feeling of adrenaline rush or that feeling of I got to do something. I don't know what, but I got to do something. You know, the the danger is when we get into this sort of 
adrenal overload where our system can't tolerate that much crisis in an ongoing way. But there is injury in feeling nothing too. It, it actually does us harm to go numb and to feel nothing. Yeah. Even if you feel like you might suffer from compassion fatigue, which is a real thing, the opposite, not feeling anything is not the solution. You know, so titrate, calibrate, know when you need to step back and take a break. Do the one small thing in a day that you can do. Um, correct someone who's misusing language, gently, lovingly, you know. Um, recognize when you have failed to be adequately empathetic to somebody suffering. Offer an apology, make amends, do some small act of kindness. And, um, and that is a way to manage that state of crisis in, in a, you know, a compartmentalized way. I talked about my father compartmentalizing. <laughs> I mean, I asked him yesterday, how is he feeling right now yeah, about Pittsburgh, for right, exactly, example? We haven't mentioned it yet today, but I said, how did you feel? Because I hadn't talked to him yet about it. And he said, well, of course it was awful and it reminded me of Germany and Kristallnacht and then right away like without even pausing he said but I find hope because of the outpouring of Love. empathy yeah. in communities all over non-Jewish communities he yeah. said that didn't happen in Germany right. that didn't happen yeah. and I find hope in that and and my father who's the greatest optimist that ever <laughs> lived <laughs> far more optimistic than I am. You know, so his ability to, to respond to the crisis by, by looking for the helpers, you right, know, that's what right, people talk exactly. about now. Look for the upstanders, we say. Um, that helps me in my crisis mentality. Yeah, definitely. Your father sounds like such a wise person. He is a very wise person, yeah. How has cultural genocide with Jewish ancestry through religious cultural marriages diluted the preservation of memories of trauma? Mm. You know, I, I can't say that I completely agree with the, the premise of the question. I don't, I don't um, completely believe that, um, that cultural dilution is, is a danger. I, um, well, I'm glad of that, since yeah. I'm culturally diluting all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> I, I think we all are, and, and, um, and that that's a good thing. Yeah. I, but, but I think that it's how you define that term or what that term means to you. I mean, I think interconnectedness in all understandings of that word is, is a good thing. Yeah. And, and that separation and um, othering others or, you know, I grew up with the vocabulary of Jews and non-Jews. That was the whole world. There was us and then there was everybody that wasn't us. Right. And, and I have to say, I, I you know, I, I quoted my father just now because he said it was the response of the non-Jews and I heard him say it and I thought that is not how I want to say it. Right, right, I right, want to exactly. say all faiths. Yeah. I want to say, you know, so this idea that, um, that I do not believe that Jews are threatened by cultural dilution. I do not believe that... Um, that you need to keep separate in order to retain your identity. I, I just don't hold that belief. Yeah. Um, what are your views on the new apartheid laws in Israel, it says, and the Israeli um, genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza? It's kind of a heavy question. Yeah, I, and I appreciate people's willingness to ask, and sometimes I say I don't want to talk about it because it's very painful to me to witness um, witness the actions of the Israeli government in my lifetime. I understand the underlying trauma that is there, I think I understand it. I feel that what, what we are witnessing in the Middle East is a perfect example of what unresolved trauma looks like over time and how it needs to be addressed on multiple levels that the more you rigidify around your victimhood, the, the less likely you are to really be able to act in a way that's um, that's healing for others as well. So I see that writ large in, in the Middle East and in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I, um, I'm not entirely comfortable with using the word genocide in that context. I, I've been 
spending a lot of time the last few days talking about the definitions of genocide. Right, right, exactly. You have a so I think there are some really important and specific um, requirements for using that word. So I don't use that word with regard to the Palestinians. Do I believe that there is dehumanizing treatment of Palestinians and, and a practice, a set of practices that I take issue with? Absolutely. I am, I am, um, I am alarmed and disturbed and, and greatly saddened by a lot of the actions in Israel against Palestinians. And it is one of the most complicated regions of the world for me, without a doubt. Right. Well, uh, another question about that region. What could, be, what we, could we be doing now for the children of Yemen and other children and adults in genocide? I really think we have to continue to demand accountability from our government and not to keep pointing the finger at, um, at the Syrians or, or the governments that are, that are literally doing the actions. Anyone that we have armed we take responsibility for what they are doing with those arms. And we, as the American public, have to keep insisting on that and demand accountability from our government in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, some of the speakers I was listening to in Sacramento were, came from the United Nations, and they were talking about the UN Security Council needing to be reformed, and I don't know how realistic that is in my lifetime, but the P5, the, the permanent five members of the UN Security Council with their veto power apparently can constantly make sure that no action is ever taken to make the powerful responsible for the arms tr trade and the, how those weapons are used, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we have to reinvent our own government. <laughs> we right. have to reinvent how the UN is working. I don't know what that looks like in a daily practice, but um, raising our voices and being knowledgeable is, is absolutely a step in that direction. In a few days, I learned so much more about global genocide and global um, structures leading to genocide that we all can learn a lot more. Yeah, I'm so glad you have it to bring to us. It's mm -hmm. just a, a mm -hmm. huge gift that you can, can share that with us. Thank you. I, I really felt humbled by what I learned in just a couple of days. Yeah. yeah. The, the um, South African representative to the UN was there um, speaking, and, um, and she said there is movement among other member nations in the United Nations General Assembly to, to create reform from within. And, you know, I was asking questions like, how can there be rules of war? I don't understand. <laughs> like, I'm just, I, I've, oh, I feel like a five-year-old asking that question, uh, but it feels so impossible for me to understand this idea of rules and war. And she kept on saying, war is, war happens. War is with us. War is, you know, but we are working hard to change these things. We, so she was, she was giving me like the big long view and, yeah. and I try to hold that too. Yeah, definitely. Um, when we first started talking about having a year of truth, I, I really wanted genocide to be part of our conversation. Mm. And mm. I'm so grateful that you came today. And um, it's such a Thank pleasure you. to meet you and to be able to ask questions and see kind of the genesis for so much of the book. Um, as we're wrapping up now, I, I wonder if you can just tell us one truth that we should take away from, from today and from our conversation and our encounter with you mm. um, in this year of truth for the cathedral. Thank you so much for having me here. I, um, it feels like such a privilege to get to talk about the things that matter the most to me yeah. and, and to feel myself a part of a very big conversation about genocide and trauma, past, present, future, and to say um, my one hope for um, a final offering is, is to remember how much words matter our own and the words of others. I know we're hearing that a lot and it's becoming kind of this, you know, ubiquitous slogan, but to take it in deeply into your own heart, what are your words that you are using unconsciously or ambiguously or without enough care about how they are being heard and received? Are you just repeating something that you heard someone else saying? Ethnic cleansing is not an okay phrase, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a propaganda term, and it's a euphemism for genocide. 
So what's happening to the Rohingya in Myanmar right now is not ethnic cleansing, it's genocide. What's happening to the Yemeni can be arguably called genocide. So, but I'm not even talking about those big powerful words, I'm talking about small words like, not small, but saying refugee when you mean refugee, not immigrant. People are not illegal. People are desperate seeking asylum. Asylum seeking is not illegal. All these ways of using language to be deeply meaningful and, and heart-based and empathetic, that's, that's my hope. Thank you. That's just what we get from you. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, please join me next week. We're going to be having as our guest Holcomb Walker, who will be talking about the Requiem Mass, a remembrance for the dead who suffered persecution for their sexual orientation or gender expression. It's going to be presented at the cathedral on November 16th and 17th with Yerba Buena Cultural Center for the Arts. Um, we have the service at upstairs at 11 o'clock. You're welcome to come join us for that. Elizabeth's going to be signing books at the back table. Um, and w we appreciate any kind of support that you can give, um, financial support for the forum. It really helps us to be able to do some good things. And thanks again, Elizabeth. We're so grateful for you coming today. Thank you, Malcolm. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, a privilege. Thank you.